uh, panel up. And, uh, and while they uh, greet each other and uh, greet ourselves and have their seats, let me just say that uh, Jeff Jarvis is, is, uh, is going to moderate this panel, but I would like to introduce Jeff officially. Um, Jeff, uh, recent, most recent book um, is entitled Public Parts, How Sharing in the Digital Age Improves the Way We Work and Live. He's also the author, as we know, of uh, What Would Google Do? And, um, and frankly, a quick, fun e-read uh, called Gutenberg the, Greek, the Geek. You know, so you can find all of these books that Jeff has written and, uh, and a lot more on uh, buzzmachine.com, his blog. Jeff is named one of the 100 most influential and respected media figures in the world by the World uh, Economic Forum. Um, he's at Davos every year and uh, South by Southwest and all of these uh, sort of conferences where you'd want to hear uh, Jeff uh, speak about his thoughts. Uh, he writes about media, technology, and business. He's a columnist for The Guardian in London. And if you're not already one of the million people, I think it is, that uh, Jeff has following him that regularly read his blog, buzzmachine.com, that covers everything controversial and interesting going on in the digital world, you should do that. When not posting and publishing, Jeff somehow finds time to serve as associate professor and director of uh, the Toe Knight Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism at the City, uh, City University of New York, Graduate School of Journalism. He's a consulting editor and a partner at Daylife, a new startup. He consults for media companies. He's a public speaker, as we know. Until 2005, he was president and creative director of Advance.net, the online arm of Advanced Publications. Prior to that, Jarvis was creator and founding editor of Entertainment Weekly, uh, Sunday editor and associate publisher of the New York Daily News, TV critic for TV Guide and People, a columnist on the San Francisco Examiner, assistant city editor and reporter for Chicago Tribune, reporter for Chicago to, uh, Today. Um, Jeff, uh, obviously, uh, is, so he, he's no um, uh, millennial uh, when, when coming to the, uh, to the internet world. Um, he's, he's found his way into it and obviously has adapted. Um, what I really want to credit Jeff for is, and personally thank him profoundly for, is his inspiration through his book, What Would Google Do, um, and dedication and commitment to be here uh, and, and continue to participate in Postal Vision 2020. Um, before I uh, uh, in actually introduce Jeff, let me also introduce Marshall Van Alstein, who uh, is back again. Thank you, Marshall. Um, he was an associate professor at uh, Boston University, visiting professor at MIT Center for Digital Business. Uh, he received his BA at Yale and MS and PhD degrees from MIT. Marshall's made significant contributions to the field of information e economics, covering such topics as communications markets, economics of n uh, networks, intellectual property, and social effects of technology, designed and implemented one of the first projects to measure how productivity affects the dollar output of individual inf information workers. He co-authored the first proof that a market could reduce spam and create more value for users than even a perfect filter. Uh, his MIT dissertation work introduced the concept of cyber balkanization, describing how IT can integrate or fragment societies. As co-developer of the concept of the two-sided networks, he's been a major contributor to the theory of network effects, a theory now taught in more than 50 business schools worldwide. Uh, Jeff, uh, uh, Marshall has uh, received the NSF uh, career, IOS and SGER awards, five best paper awards, multiple patents. Has, um, his work has appeared in Science, Management Science, Harvard Business Review, Strategic Management uh, Journal, and Popular Press. Um, Sid Hoda is uh, general manager for, uh, for Cisco's Emerging Solutions Group and his first time here with us at Postal Vision 2020 and the first time I've had an opportunity to meet Sid, so welcome Sid. Uh, he's the key leader of uh, Cisco's Smart and uh, Plus Connected Communities, an initiative to help change the ways cities are designed, managed, and renewed to achieve economic, social, environmental sustainability. Uh, Mr. Hoda's responsibility for business strategy, solution development, operations partnerships, and go-to-market. Uh, previously, Sid was chief of staff of the Cisco Globalization Office in Bangalore, India. His responsibilities included globalization strategy development, planning, and operations. As globalization leader, 
Sid was responsible for working with uh, headquarters business functions to implement and accelerate Cisco's globalization strategy at an enterprise level to fuel Cisco's next generation of growth, innovation, and talent. Prior to that, uh, Sid was with Cisco's Internet Business Solutions Group. In that capacity, he advised many of the world's leading companies in achieving business results through enterprise process innovation and strategic application of technology. Um, Mr. Hoda is an editor of recently published Cisco publication, Connected Transport. His areas of focus uh, include, include marketing and consumer buying. Uh, this is, uh, let's, oh no, I'm sorry, this is when he was at Capgemini. Um, I uh, previously uh, worked for Capgemini, and, uh, which was e &Y, uh, it was the old E&Y, I guess, where he led strategy practice for retail and consumer and transportation I industries. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, let's, I, uh, Sid began his career at IBM, uh, where he worked in various marketing and sales management uh, positions. Uh, he's most recently segment leader for the retail and distribution verticals. Uh, Mr. Hoda uh, holds an MBA from Emory University, a BS in industrial engineering from Case Western. Larry Weber is back with us again. And uh, Larry's a, a, a good friend and, and has been an early supporter of Postal Vision 2020, and we appreciate that. Larry is, um, is at the forefront of uh, the use of technology and PR in the public relations field. He's been in this business for more than two decades. He's chairman of W2 Group, a global marketing services ecosystem that helps CMOs in their new role as business, as builders of communities and content. Uh, W2 Group includes Digital Influence Group and Race Point Group, who's helping us with our publicity, and so we thank you for that. In 1987, Larry founded the Weber Group, uh, which within a decade became the world's largest uh, public relations firm, um, Weber Shanwick Worldwide. And uh, Larry became the chairman and CEO of Interpublic's Advanced Marketing Services Group, where he built and oversaw an $800 million group that included the world's top PR, healthcare, branding, research, entertainment, and, and uh, exper experiential marketing firms. Um, he's also co-founder and chairman of Massachusetts Innovation and Technology Exchange and uh, the world's largest inter interactive uh, advocacy organization. Um, Larry is, uh, I, I can also go on with all of Larry's credentials and I realize uh, our, our panel is, uh, is uh, all covered. Uh, these guys uh, know their stuff. Um, they've been thinking about platforms for a long time. Um, I am sure that you, like I am extremely impressed with credentials and more importantly, we should be with what they are about to say. And what I would like to do is introduce Jeff and, um, and have Jeff moderate this panel uh, to talk about um, platform perspectives and how that relates to the Postal Service. So thank you, Jeff. Thank you, uh, John. We'll get the... Uh, I think Phil did a superb job of defining the platform and, and, and creating the structure for what platforms are. Um, uh, sorry, I just I caused that. <laughs> Uh, so what I really want to get to further quickly is, is whether it's the right path for the post office, the postal service, uh, if we need a platform, who should be that platform? Is it the postal service? Uh, platform for whom with what? But before we do that, does anyone, and you don't have to have an answer to this, but does anyone have anything to add uh, to what uh, Phil did a great job with in terms of a def definition of a platform? So we set the structure of what a platform is. One of the things I would emphasize is the network effects. You want to build a platform in such a way that one block of users attracts another set of users so the ecosystem grows. Phil actually did a very nice job of articulating that, you know, one person advertises it, but you want to set it up in such a way. It's like these are credit cards, right? Merchants will carry a, a MasterCard, then you'll want to actually carry a MasterCard. You want to actually feed back and forth and emphasize the network effect. Or if there are lots of developers on the ecosystem, that's where the users will go. And then when the users are there, that's when the developers will go there. So create these feedbacks among different user populations. I think one thing, so I, first of all, I loved you saying things like consumer driven. Uh, more than ever, the world of IT, or I come from the world of business is consumer driven. Um, I think one thing about the platform I'd add is, um, it has to be built around gray. So we don't know what we're gonna be doing, how we're gonna be doing it in, in the future. So very often platforms are designed with a rear view mirror. 
here's how we're doing it today, here's how Google's doing it, and I would caution you, um, I would say that out of the gang of four, in 15 years, two might not be around. I don't know which two they are. I'm not smart enough to make that investment. That's why I'm still, still sitting here and not on an island somewhere. Um, uh, but be careful about looking in the rearview mirror. It is gray, <coughs> so if your platform is built around uh, being comfortable and not knowing stuff, you'll, then you'll be successful. But if it's built around too much fact-based, you've got to be careful with that. That's all. So there's one other interesting idea that's worth mentioning, which is where to open. One of the things that obscures, you know, Apple is now the world's most valuable company. It surpassed even Exxon Mobil in market capitalization. It kind of obscures the fact that in 2000, it almost went bankrupt, right? It was almost gone. In the 1990s, they were too closed, right? They were actually charging developers in order to develop their ecosystem. They made some terrible mistakes at that point. They were too closed and they actually didn't build ecosystems early on. And they learned from those mistakes. So we need to look at the evolution and the trajectory. And I think uh, that's that, that I would have one more thing, and then we'll move on to the USPS. Uh, I, I think that a platform, you know it's successful when your users take it over and use it in a way you couldn't imagine, which is, which is a funny phrase, right? And, and that's sure. when you know you are truly useful. Uh, Craigslist, uh, I often say that if Microsoft had invented it, uh, it would have come with a, a manual this thick and a talking paper clip to describe how to use it exactly. <laughs> uh, but Craig said, I don't know, he made this thing, and he, little did he know that people would use it to find each other and homes and jobs after Katrina. It was taken over by its users, and that's when you know it's useful. So um, this notion of platform really came out of the last Postal Vision 2020 that, that, that John so, so brilliantly organized. And, and the question is, I think to start off with, uh, let's, let's make an assumption here that, that we need a platform for the economy in certain services. Now, that's a very broad statement. So we have a lot of questions that we have to answer in the next half hour uh, and talk as fast as I do, um, which is uh, what are those services, for whom, and who should do them? So, so why don't you start off with what do you think, do you think it's right, go, let's start here. Do you think this notion of looking at the USPS as a platform is the right notion at all? Is it uh, possible? It, it's certainly possible, but, but you're right, Jeff. You can't, and I make this point in the book, you, no one's building a platform for beepers, right? No one uses beepers anymore. So I'm not saying that we're at that point with the Postal Service, but to assume that everyone has always used you, will always use you, your services, I think is very much a mistake. Uh, platforms do, as Marshall pointed out, take your products and services in different directions. So. I, I'll say this, building a platform guarantees nothing. Uh, I think that it increases the chances that you'll continue to be relevant. Um, I agree with that. The, you know, when I look at the postal service, I, I look at it like any other client. You know, what are the <coughs> attributes that made it successful in the first place? So one, it's very local, which I think there's probably some opportunity to actually apply you know, its locality to its future use, uh, whether that be a developed platform or not. Uh, second is it's known, so it's a brand that's known and has some trust, and so I think that can be uh, used uh, quite a bit uh, in the future. And also it understands logistics obviously very well, so it can deliver things. So I often think that uh, they don't, you know, what wasn't mentioned, and I know Phil was going to have a slide on it, was the sophistication of our software systems. <coughs> the reason those four companies uh, the gang of four that Phil talks about is American software is so brilliant. And I think if the postal service is going to do anything around a platform, it's going to have to engage with software visionaries and an understanding of creating a software platform that can meet different applications. And one of them <coughs> that comes right to mind would be a subscription service around content so that, you know, individuals can actually trust a service, maybe it's called the Franklin service, or whatever that supplies content on everything from health-related issues to sports-related issues, but it's routing kind of different data and it uses those kinds of systems uh, to work. So I think there's a lot of creativity that needs to go in to the thinking of a, quote, platform. And I also actually don't think it's consumer-driven. I think that's something I would maybe is being misdefined in the, um, <coughs> in the discussion here. Uh, all four of those companies don't care about the consumer, in my opinion. I think, uh, I, no, I think they have decided what they wanted. I worked with Steve Jobs. 
He did not care about market okay, research well, and, you know. Regardless of that, let, yeah. before we get into kind of, I think, starting with what the Postal Service is, and starting with what it can come from there, I think we have to start with what the <coughs> needs are and thus what the, where the opportunities are. Yeah. So I still want to go up in the altitude a little bit. Okay. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, in, in, in the idea of designing to gray, designing to what you don't know, means it's really hard to make that, that choice. But so, so what are the needs? Let's start right there. What, what, at a very high level, what do we think the economy needs? Uh, or maybe one way to ask it is if there were no postal service, what would we, what would we do? Well, if I could jump in here. Has anyone ever heard of uh, 3D printers? This is fascinating to me. I saw a preview of this on, I think it was Bloomberg West. And over two hours, they printed a guitar. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about shipping physical stuff, maybe five years ago, people, of course, you're always going to have to ship them. Or if you read uh, The Power of Pull by David Siegel, and he talks about in the future bookstore with the semantic web, and this is 10, 15 years away. He talks about literally a bookstore half the size of this room that can print any book ever in any language. So maybe that's a threat to Amazon. So I, I don't know that in the future you will always need to ship things. Um, well, yeah, I, I, the last 2020, I argued that if it can be digital, it will be digital. And that involves communication of any sort. Uh, uh, individual communication, transactions, advertising will hit the digital. Delivery is where there's huge opportunity, and that's an unknown, that's true. Uh, but I think if we get too <coughs> literal about the post office being there to deliver things, right, that, that may be too literal a definition of what it does. What does it add to an ecosystem? And I think that the, this, this notion of the ecosystem, this notion of disparate, getting away from the idea of a vertically integrated industry to an ecosystem of various members operating in different ways. You've studied ecosystems, Marshall. Describe the economy's needs now as an ecosystem. Well, let, me, uh, let me back up and actually give you two thoughts. One of them is, uh, with respect to doing a platform or not doing a platform, I actually don't think we have a choice. I think the post office has to do a platform. Uh, historically, one of the reasons is that uh, even a great product will be beaten by a mediocre platform any time. Mm -hmm. So it's only a question of who's going to control the platform, not whether it's going to be a platform that wins this kind of an industry. So I think we have to start with platform thinking, although I completely agree with Bill that you know, simply building it doesn't necessarily mean they were going to come. Stepping stones that might get us there. So one of the things you might want to do is to start articulating the feature set the developers can start to play with in order to create that ecosystem. So if you take the iPod pre-iPhone, it did only one thing, it played MP3 files. There's no reason to open that up. The iPod by itself doesn't serve as a platform. But now take the iPhone, what happens? You've got an MP3 player, you've got a geolocator, you've got a phone, you've got an unbelievable screen on it. You've got um, music and fantastic um, other features on there. You could get the um, accelerometer so you can actually start to do the game. You now you've got a dozen different features you can recombine in ways that Apple never even thought of. The trick for the post office is going to be articulate what's this set of features that others can then build upon to create this whole ecosystem rather than keeping something so closed or offering one thing alone. So maybe this is features among document archival. Maybe this is features among secure um, uh, records. Maybe it's... Um, uh, pro uh, it's procurement and uh, presentment. These are features of things that you need to have others start to build upon, opening these up in ways that others can start to build layers on top of your ecosystem. But why does it have to be the post office? You said you're, you're, you're a gigantic company looking for opportunities. Uh, uh, let's be honest. You know, I work in the news industry where, where, where I see young bloggers come in and see uh, areas of vulnerability in big old companies where they can take advantage. What are the areas of vulnerability where you could take over functions of what is now the postal service? Well, you know, we are, but the fact is that the Postal Service still ha is uh, the dominant physical network in America, like the highway system. I mean, they, uh, this is a strength. They should build off that strength. So when they build a platform, they should recognize what are we good at, what are we, what are we really good at, and what are we not good at. But do we still need it? Uh, I, you know, it's a good question. Uh, do we need it for the things that we used to need it for? Maybe not. But can we use it for different reasons? Maybe. And let me, let me give you, we're talking about, I live in Palo Alto, California, for me names, the brands that you mentioned is like my, my neighbors. And so sometimes using the word post office in Palo Alto feels a little weird, frankly. It's like the opposite, opposite <laughs> world. And using words like subway station feel a little weird in Palo Alto. But let me tell you, give you an example. New York subway system, the biggest and 
um, some would argue, kind of behind a little bit in some ways, right? They're building a platform. What they're good at is networking New York City. No one will ever network New York City physically the way they have, period. But they're somewhat of a black hole in technology. You walk downstairs, you can't use your cell phone, you can't get Wi-Fi. You, you don't pretty know much where the next train's coming. You don't know right. that. And by the way, the maps and the walls, somehow wherever station I'm at, that one's blacked out in graffiti. So I don't know how I get from <laughs> anywhere. <anyway. laughs> they're building a digital platform. They're, for the first time, they're actually saying, we got to do this better. We need to be uh, uh, you know, around digital services that are required for my travelers, my, my, my tourists, et cetera. Um, they're not building a, a digital way, a kiosk to sort of show maps, but actually a platform. Why is it a platform? Because they want developers to build stuff. They want the community to actually uh, contribute to this. They want third parties. Zagat is on this thing, for example. Um, but what they do own is space, physical space that nobody else owns and everybody could ever have. Right. So they're, they're kind of taking our, their strength as physical platform, not literally platform, platform, and adding digital layers and other layers together and enabling them. And, and, Im and imagine what they can do if, say, you, one <coughs> of your trips was to go to Shea Stadium for the Mets game, right. and it was linked into the weather service. Hey, make sure you bring an umbrella. Exactly. Okay, okay. Uh, but let me, let, me, let me just push back. Sure, of Because I come from the newspaper industry. Yeah, yeah. And uh, apropos to the discussion of the postal service, you, you, you have newspapers now reducing frequency mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and realizing that what they thought was their strength, we own the press, you don't, yeah, yeah, yeah is now an albatross around their necks, a terribly costly uh, uh, albatross of, of physical space, physical structure that they don't need anymore. Mm -hmm. So let's, I guess we start here. Is the strength or the weakness of the post office the fact that it has all those physical assets and physical space? Oh, you know, that's an interesting question because of the, of the big four that Phil talked about, there's only one that has succeeded in physical space and, or even tried, and that's Apple. You know, so, you know, is there a lesson to be learned around the use of physical space, you know, as an extension of a platform? Uh, and could the postal service actually use a physical space like Apple has been able to do, you know? The other question that came to mind was, you know, have they seeded too much already the postal service in sort of vertical applications like, you know, to banks for bill paying to, you know, has, mm -hmm. have they, have they are, can they get that back? Can they get things back, payments, uh, you know, or at least have a, a competitive uh, offering in, in specific vertical offerings, so that would be a excellent. question too. The, the physical space actually is an albatross, but there are ways to use it. Take a look historically at how Kmart used to manage as a retailer versus Walmart. Kmart would take ownership of all the goods and service and then they would actually have to manage all of the money for that. Walmart, in contrast, actually has Procter and & Gamble and Purina come in and manage them shelves, and it's almost used the physical space like a platform, yeah. having other people come in and manage the shelving space. I like that. This is an opportunity for the build post office there, to build an yeah. ecosystem, to use Physically. platform concepts yeah. across the physical space. Yeah. So you could have retailers tell you what they want to sell through that retail space by bidding on increments of space and having them come in and management like Walmart has done as opposed to Kmart. And you could be much more effective and possibly use that as an opportunity. Okay, so that's, that's go ahead, Phil. I was going to say this is actually quite similar to, to some discussions I've had with some different uh, library and museum consortia. They have, I don't know how many libraries are in this country, but it's physical space. So if you're trying to compete with Google or the internet just to get information, you're never going to win. But you have this, phys what can you do there? What kind of events? Because there's still something to be said for in-person contact. So knowing that, how can you take that in a different direction? I think it's a very similar kind of dilemma. How do you stay relevant? But you do have the physical space, and I do think it's a potential asset. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll stick with this for a second. So you, it also has, obviously, an incredible uh, infrastructure of logistics and people. It has lots of people on the street. How do you turn that into a platform? You have to have to evolve what, uh, with what they do. What do those people do? If what they do is carry from here to there, then they're going to have less to carry. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier, you know, John talked about how you know we don't want this 18 feet thing to happen. Yes, we do. We do want that to happen because that's better for my life and for your lives as consumers. Frankly, I don't want paper in my house. I don't want paper bills. I forget to pay paper bills. That's why my phone gets cut off once in a while. But digital bills are easy to pay. It's automatic. So yes, I do want that to happen. I want to happen automatically. I don't want to have to do and natural processes um, to do that. So, so um, uh, <coughs> therefore, it's going to happen. 
you said earlier, whatever can be digital will be. So if you're assuming we're going to carry that much paper around the country, we're not. We're not, unless we want that paper. Because I, I still like certain magazines and paper. But what do they do for a living? Maybe that's what's different. And the tools they have, could that make them, in some ways, different kinds of more knowledgeable workers to deliver other kinds of services? So that's the question is, what could those resources do? Huge so network, physical network across every town in America with people. But what they did isn't as relevant as what they could do. Uh, Jeff, this is on, uh, actually Sid, I'm gonna ask the first question from the audience and uh, I encourage anybody else to, to, to either step up over there or uh, just you. put your hand up and we'll hand a mic out. I'm gonna play Oprah. Go ahead, but I'm gonna run around. It looks oh, more like oh, a Donahue. First. All right, well, actually my question, I have the first question for Sid and it's, uh, it's based on what you were just saying but also what you said earlier about how platforms die. And, um, and most of the conversation I want to suggest and it is, it relates to platforms that are businesses and businesses need to make a profit and they need to serve their uh, shareholders. And then, okay, maybe you serve your shareholders by better serving consumers and whatnot, but it's all about sustaining your business, correct? Um, what I'd like to raise the question is, 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 is there a difference? Uh, do you see a difference uh, between government's responsibility um, to, uh, to act as a platform? Um, and, and to your point, Sid, uh, yes, I'm, I'm personally uh, happy to uh, pay my bills online. Uh, but when I mention that uh, issue about AT&T, it's, it's that uh, we don't, as an industry, like the idea that this product is going away and causing us uh, to incur such great losses, and yet there are people who do need it and want it. They want their paper, and they need delivery, and they need physical uh, product delivery. And we'll get very much into detail on that. But uh, I guess what I would like to raise the question is, and just ask you guys what you think about that, that is there some responsibility on the part of government or should government be looked at differently as a platform than the private sector? I mean, that's a really fundamental question, John. If you look at the Gang of Four and <coughs> complain about Facebook's selling potential data to advertisers or Google mining the data or putting its own search results ahead of competitors, you know, is it ethical or not? I'm not going to judge that, but Google is a business. It has a fiduciary responsibility to its shareholders. It's not a utility. You raise a huge point there. On around, you know, the, the Postal Service has so much data if they really wanted to collect data on everything that's delivered to you. And why couldn't they be allowed to sell that data to advertisers and to, uh, you know, digital couponing, loyalty people, uh, et cetera, much like they did in the traditional form? I mean, why not do it in the digital form as well? And the, the potential for that is maybe beyond the scope here, but I mean, Amazon knows its customers incredibly well. That's why when it recommends, oh, hey, you know, Larry, we know you like business books, have Correct. you thought about blah, blah, blah. Imagine if then you knew what you were getting across vendors and you could potentially say, you seem to buy a lot of you know, rock albums or something. I mean, I, I don't know if that's a potential or violates privacy, but th there is potential for innovation. Are we unleashing it? But John, to back to what you asked about, I think about profitability. There is a difference, of course. Um, but not in sustainability. And that's where I think the platforms required in postals for sustainability. By the way, for companies too, it's, it's, I mean, profit's a very quarterly thing that if you get misguided by profit, then you won't be sustainable. So I think it's even for companies, platforms make it sustainable. Platforms make it so that you're not a, you know, this year's nice flavor that we mentioned earlier as well. Technology leadership doesn't last very long in this world. And, um, and we know that very, very well because of tough business. But platforms are more sustainable. And so the question for the Postal Service is, is um, what, did, what makes your platform, uh, how does your platform make you sustainable and to be around in a few years? And, us, and, and our kids, so by the way, the people who like the paper um, are a lot of us and a lot of our parents. Uh, I've got a 12-year-old. I don't think he's going to like that kind of stuff, frankly. There, there's two ways to look at platforms, I think. One, one is, that, is that value today falls to the platform. You have uh, entrepreneurial efforts that can start on top of a platform because it exists. Uh, you have networks that start to bring to critical mass, but a lot of value falls to the platform, Google, Facebook, the, the, the big four. The other way to look at it is something like Firefox, which because it exists, it is a pressure on the network because it exists as an open platform or, or, or um, uh, Apache or these, these software platforms that also exist in a different way. They're a different kind of platform. 
but, but the fact that they exist enable businesses to start, enable businesses to succeed. We can look at the government, I think, in either way. Anybody want to uh, challenge or ask out? This is appropriate for the Postal Service. We'll bring you home delivery of the microphone. <laughs> when you're out here, please identify yourself. Hi, John Mesha, IMS. Uh, Phil, we got a chance to talk last night, and uh, your, your points today were great. Now, one of the things that, you know, we're a big stakeholder in this, this whole conversation. You know, our, our business, we're, you know, we're a printer and mailer. We're a commingler. So this is important to us. But what, one of the main things I don't think was identified in the value is the trust with USPS. Mm -hmm. it, I don't think it was hit on yet. So that's, I think that's the biggest asset of the USPS for communications, I mean, mail communications, People in their homes. So define trust that them. a little bit. What are the what are the now break that down? What are the aspects of trust that that are that are platform like and sustainable and necessary? Just list two or three. What does trust mean? Uh, very very simply, uh, you don't think it could be broken. You don't think it'd be necessarily tampered. We know that's not true, yeah, but tampering. everyone feels that uh, I'm getting in the mail, so it's safe. We talk about email. There's spam. It could be tampered with. It's not as safe as necessarily getting something uh, in the mail. That, at least that's, I think, a feeling of a lot of people. So when, when you look at this, uh, the other thing they do well is delivering the last mile. But I think those are the two best things they do. So, so where does this go? When we talk about uh, the safety of this, you know, last 2020 and, and 1.0, we talked about digital mailboxes and, and where that could be. Now, if the USPS put their stamp on one, whether it be a Zoom box, a volley, whomever it might be, I think it'd be migration there. I think people might take it more seriously, but I think the evolution in business there is slower because they're not embracing it or putting their stamp of approval on it. So I just want to circle around because it, you guys were making a lot of great points, but the trust factor never came up, and I just wanted to put it back to you guys on that. Um, actually, it's a really interesting point, and I do think that folks do trust the brand for the Postal Service. At the same time, the Postal Service has a heavier burden to bear, and that goes into the pr earlier question on what are the government's responsibilities, because your first-class mail is sealed against inspection, and that's one of the reasons you really trust the post office. When you send a message on Facebook, it sure is not sealed against inspection. Um, you send something on Google, and it is certainly not sealed against inspection. Matter of fact, that's how they're offering all this content analysis and services on top. So one of the things that would be very difficult is for the post office to go in and read your first class mail and offer you that stuff, but that would be a violation of the trust. So we have to be a little careful about what's feasible to do within the postal context and what its responsibilities as a government would be. So I think that's something that, that Dave Williams, the, the Inspector General, will probably talk about tomorrow. It's the values layer. And, and there's a question there about principle in the government. Part of what we're talking about is not just what the USPS as an organization does, but I think part of John's question, going back to that, is what should we expect of the government at a level of principle? Should we have this kind of, kind of protection in letters, in email? Whether, you know, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a question of principle, so it doesn't have anything to do with the organization. Other questions, arguments, anything? I'll come to you. Let me ask the question, where, where? I, I don't see it. Ah, there, okay. Hi, this is Mohammed Adra from the OIG. Um, just to anyone on the panel, you know, uh, somebody mentioned the notion of trust. My question is, is this notion of trust with the Postal Service, we earned it in the physical space. Is it easily transferable to the digital space? I think, I think Amazon was used because of trust early on. Um, it's not the cheapest price out there. Uh, it affected very often what, what was never, but it was trustworthy. If you liked what you got, great. If you didn't like it, you returned it, no questions asked. It was a place you could buy it with confidence. Uh, I think it's easy to prove if you can execute against it. Trust is really, uh, in this digital age, very quick to be judged and to, and, and to, to have trust because um, people kind of you know, see it in action. So if you can back it up and digitally, then yeah, absolutely there's trust. I, I still think Amazon is, is where it is because people trust them. They know the payments, the security, return, all that stuff makes it a great place to the get. The trust and the ease of use. And right, the use one click is brain dead yes, simple. Yes. But I, I think the, the trust quickly goes as a, as a grant. And, and the reason Amazon's so successful is they understood how to create a digital environment 
that's attractive and that it's a place that you like to go and do more things than just buy, right? I, I spent over an hour, you're going to say, Larry, get a life. But, you know, over an hour the, uh, the other night because I posted some reviews, I read some reviews of my stuff, I uh, bought some books, I looked at some videos of authors, you know, uh, they, I bought 11 books, so they got what they wanted, but it wasn't as much a commerce experience as much as it was a digital attraction of an environment that I stayed in. So the idea of platforms is environments that have trust as part of them, but also are very attractive is going to be something that's increasingly important. All right, so, so this, is, this is the beginning of a definition of trust, I think, uh, as a base of platform, right? We hear trust that something's really going to be delivered, yeah. trust that it's not going to be tampered with along the way, uh, trust, uh, I think, in that identity, the, that trust the in address and identity is an important Trust in the experience. Right. Trust in the experience. Is there anything else that defines the trust that we need as a platform in commerce in this country? And you'll be there tomorrow. You won't be, you won't be gone tomorrow. Ah, okay, trust great. that it's solvent, trust that you'll get paid. In the example I've talked about before, Amanda Hawking made a million dollars selling ebooks on Amazon. She didn't worry about getting paid. I think there's some trust there. There's also a trust, I think, and this may be a restriction, at universality, right? And that, that I can get anywhere with this. Yeah. Hey, Larry, that's it. Uh, Pierre, Pierre Cacho with Decision Analysis Partner. Uh, picking up on the notion of trust and trying to understand what at the root of uh, the creation of a platform needs to exist. Uh, I have a question to Phil primarily, but to the panel as well. Uh, the, the Gang of Four, do you, would you say that they have a, a DNA that is clearly identified and that defines what they are and can continue to evolve into? And picking up on this is, is for example, the, the dinosaurs that we've mentioned, the Kodaks and the Polaroids, that they have their proper, their own DNA and fail to uh, allow it to evolve. And the reason I'm bringing this up is I'm trying to understand as we bring the discussion back to the Postal Service, does it have to identify and clarify its DNA of which trust I is a key component, maybe an outcome of its DNA, but does it have to define that and then going forward say, given who we are, given our DNA, this is the kind of platform that we can establish? Thank you. Yes, on the DNA, these companies have certain things ingrained. It is very difficult for Google to think like a social company because it's run by two technologists, right? It's an algorithm. It's not so much based on friends. Now they're trying to change it. But uh, and you think about, and, and if I'm wrong here, please uh, jump in, anybody. The only two technology-oriented companies that have sort of come back from the dead, and, and Marshall's right with, or was it Larry who said Apple, Apple 2000, yeah. it was dead. If Microsoft didn't invest $150 million in Apple, Apple may not be around. And it wasn't App, uh, Microsoft making a good investment. Remember, this was during the antitrust era. So Microsoft was concerned that they literally had the only operating system in town. Um, but IBM and Apple are the only two tech companies I can think of that have come back from the dead. That's why I'm not terribly bullish on Yahoo. AT&T. Mm, okay. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah, sort of. In, in a different way. Yeah. It's, actually, it's, not, it's, not, it's really SBC. They took the brand back. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. It's, it's, it wasn't really AT&T. The, yeah, right, the, the brand survived. Yeah, the brand survived. Microsoft had platform DNA in the 1980s and 90s, which stock's been a terrible investment for 10 years. They have not been able to innovate in the same way. Have you heard the story about the tablet at Microsoft? There's a great CNET article, some, some of you nodding your heads. To make a long story short, Microsoft had some pretty interesting uh, tablet technology oh, that wow. went up to the highest level of the company. And Steve Ballmer said flat out, does this help Office, does this help Windows? Short answer was no. Within two months, the guys propelling that particular initiative weren't even with the company anymore. I, I think Pierre's question is really important because it, 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 it's, it's the basic crux question I think we get to in 2020 here, is what's the starting point of this discussion for platform? Is it the postal service as it exists? And gee, what else could it do? How could we take its DNA? How could we adapt it? How could we do things like that? Or the other question is, no, uh, the opposite. Uh, what do we need? And the way to ask that question is a little harsh, and, and I don't mean this uh, in any way, but, but, but I hear newspapers all the time say, you're going to miss us when we're gone. Mm -hmm. So if we had no Postal Service tomorrow, if we went bankrupt tomorrow, if Congress just said, OK, to heck with it tomorrow, not going to happen, I know. But let's see, if we could get near that, what are we missing? What does the economy need that only, to John's point then, the government could probably provide? Answers to that question. There's no Postal Service. What do we need? Both what's the opportunity to be built, but also what do we what do we need as an economy? Anybody? 
These are better questions to answer when you have a single malt in your hand and you have a chance to think and <laughs> great, great <laughs> You're probably going to need a bridge strategy of some kind because um, there still needs the physical delivery. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to have some kind of bridge strategy that doesn't cost as much, and I don't know the answer you know, to that. The next one is, is that you raise a good point, Jeff, around thinking about open systems and that maybe what the government's job is to be more like a Mozilla or you know, an Ubuntu or something that is much more an open system that gets things done and accomplished uh, that allows people to use a capitalist situation. You know, so okay, stay on that for a second, Larry. Because when you create an open system, you're, you're not necessarily just creating the code. You're creating the means for people to create the code. Correct. You're creating a structure that enables that to happen, and you're creating principles that define that, right? And isn't that what Franklin and the founding fathers did? That's what I'm saying. To create yeah. a set of a set of principles to have government work within, and we've gotten a bit away from that. And maybe if you go to an open software platform system approach to the post office, it could be pretty powerful if done right, because now you're bringing, like yeah. to Phil's point, you're bringing the ecosystem to you to start to right. develop things. And um, you know, so. Well, think about the process of asking for permission. Often Facebook and Google, Amazon, Apple will overextend, they'll overreach, and they have to pull back. Imagine. We, those companies wouldn't be anywhere near what they are today if they had to run through all of these different rules and regulations. Can we agree on that? Mm -hmm. They innovate first and ask questions later. Now, ah, okay, okay, really important. So, so if, if the Postal Service, can the Postal Service innovate? Right? What it needs is freedom. What it needs is the ability to fail, things the government doesn't like much, <laughs> right? What it needs is, um, what else? Marshall, I mean, you it were needs, around innovators needs, all the time. Well. It needs the ability to function a little bit more like a business. If you look at some of the healthiest posts around the world today, right. it's folks like Post Italiana or it's folks like Deutsche Post. They literally own other industries. They own banks. They own credit card businesses. They own telecommunications infrastructure. They have been allowed to serve as business. It's very hard to compete with business and yet not be allowed to function like a business. That came up in the last post of uh, and post that's, 2020, yes. That's something, that's a stricture that's going to have to be listed, lifted if the post office is really going to start to develop like a real platform. It's going to have to partner with businesses, but it's going to have to be allowed to, to compete with business and under businesses. And the or privatize it to be a business. That's one of the other key questions, right? Is it a, that's is a business make it a business or not? Right? Yeah. And these right. are the big questions to ask. And when it becomes a business, what do you do when someone, say, in Iowa complains that the shipping is so much high, right? Well, shouldn't it be my constitutional right? as such and such, and that's, I think, that's an inherent tension, right, business versus utility. I don't have the right answer, mm -hmm. but you're going to make enemies. There are plenty, I think, um, when I was researching the book, uh, back in 2009 or 2010, Facebook was voted the 10th or 9th most hated company. So are you willing to have that kind of vitriol out there? Right. Or me, uh, go to the question here, we're gonna come back to you one second, um, and then we're gonna end, I know. Uh, John's nervous here. Uh, we're going to use the new technology here to try to ask and answer this question. Does the platform model apply to the U.S. Postal Service? Right? Is this even, this is the basis of discussion we started off with. Is it the right basis for discussion? Uh, and you see the answers possible are yes, it's a platform that enables. No, it's primarily a service provision. Yes and no, which is the, ch the chicken answer. <laughs> and none of the above, which is the secondary chicken answer. Uh, how would each of you answer that question? Uh, if you want to survive, that's your first column. But as currently uh, constituted, I would say second. Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually a very good point. As currently constituted, probably not a platform, but if it's going to survive, it, ah. needs, it needs to have a platform. Okay, all right, that's, re that's a great point to end on, but let's try that. So as currently uh, provided, it, it, the USPS is a service provider, not a platform, and we're saying that it should become a platform to survive and to be valuable. Mm -hmm. So let's end off here with, once more, what the hell does that mean? Mm -hmm. Each of you just go through once and say, what, what is your vision for the USPS as a useful, valuable, trusted, necessary platform for the US? I'm going to end with you, Marshall. Um, in order to serve as a platform, we need to define the features and functions that others can use and build upon to actually be useful. It means opening at different layers and con having certain control points that you're going to be able to profit from as others go through the system. As with Apple, you have to sell through the iTunes store so that they can take the 30% 30, 30 cut. So let's articulate those features that the post office is most useful for in terms of the universal service obligations, the authentication, security, 
seal against inspection. Use those as services that others can build upon and actually open layers that actually can add to it, but still maintain some control points. So imagining the businesses that people could create if only this existed, where if I had a trusted place where I could do all kinds of trusted things, wow, I could create new businesses. Absolutely. Layers. And then also use, it, also use those ideas retrospectively for some of the physical infrastructure yeah. uh, and use those things as well. I concur with that. I, I think it can be a platform, but I think it needs to be an open platform. I would go, and it's going to be a lot of hard work, but I would go the model much like Google has with giving free email, free, you know, sort of systems. When I started my business, it was very expensive. Kids can start businesses now for almost nothing. And I would get, the, 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 if the post office were able to come up with an open platform that was free and then charge for services that would include physical delivery, mm -hmm. all right, then I think there's a chance that it could compete as a business, but also be a real, a real service to uh, Americans. Now, can I supplement? It likes the Skype model, where yeah. some of the ba absolute basics are free, and then you charge for that extra connectivity. Yep. That's the kind of thing that would actually work yeah. very nicely. Although Microsoft will screw that up. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think if it's um, a platform that the Postal Service moves towards, then it starts thinking about citizen services and not mail. Citizen services delivered either digitally or physically. Uh, this takes advantage of its location and its strength. But it's around, you know, what uh, are the services the citizens need and how do they need them? And the fact that the postal, the reason why the Postal Italia and Deutsche are such successful is because they have a great physical presence that's now, you know, expanding the way Amazon somewhat did, new, new more services. And so <laughs> think about citizen services, not about post. Yep. Think about what you have, which is a great physical network, and think about the future of what not what we want in this room, frankly. Nobody in this room is your future. It's these people's kids and grandkids. That's who you've got to satisfy. Forget about the people in this room. And they we don't really know. They have to stop thinking like a broadcaster, which that's the a past era, much like to your newspaper thing. The post office thinks, uh, post service thinks like a broadcaster, not an engager. And if you don't think like an engager, then you're point. not going to win. Yeah. All right, yeah. finally, Dr. Platform. <laughs> Let's take it up a level. I see government as a platform and a postal service as a plank. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Great end. Thank you all very Great much. Point.